be here. I love young people and I, the young at heart. I believe that they can find or discover in themselves what they didn't know they had and then go on to do the seemingly impossible. I'm also passionate about effective leadership in practice. The privilege to engage with you on the same stage as the Vice President of the United States of America can be overwhelming. But thankfully, my feet are steady. My message is primarily targeted at the youth of Ghana and Africa. If you don't fall in this bracket, but you feel you still have something to offer humanity, you may want to pay attention to. The title of my message is that your time is now. Your time is now. Why? Why your time? We are in an era of technological advancement. Is your era. We need energy, speed, and time to solve our problems. You have these. It's your time. We need new ideas and the courage to experiment them, and you have them. So please, come out of your shells. We need young blood to transfer our knowledge and wisdom to. Come, get it. Indeed, your time is here. I recall when as a new young management trainee in a multinational company many, many years ago, I was asked to select which functional area I would prefer to work in. The advertisement for management trainees had sold to us a company which described itself as the best employer with opportunities for unparalleled training and development and a career in a wide range of functions with international repute. Although I had survived the grueling recruitment process, and been selected with a few other graduates, I was not prepared for the question that I was asked. Did I have ambitions? Yes, I did. Did I know how to arrive at those dreams? I'm not sure. I thought I did, but I didn't. That is what I realized when confronted with that offer. What do you want to do? I had to choose, and so I did. I selected three areas in order of preference. The company took note of my first choice and worked at it. Now, 30 years on and more, when I look back, my life and passions have largely been shaped by these choices that I made at the time, and I am immensely grateful. I wish most organizations would ask you such questions early in your youth. I wish they and the adults who shape our lives would offer that opportunity for us to appreciate the power affects the choice we make every day. In the next few minutes, I would love to share with you eight of the many invaluable lessons that life has taught me. They concern the choices we, you need to make to optimize your time, which is now. Number one, things don't just happen. They are orchestrated, they are planned, and they are made to happen. You don't wish things into being. You can't just wish that you had a certain wife with some character attributes, and then bingo, there she is. No, it requires some hard work and some sincere vibes, you know, to this lady. You don't just say, I would own a business or a successful business in future, and one day you wake up and you find your business name on a huge building with your office on the top floor overlooking the city of Accra. No, it requires tons of hard work and disappointments. We cannot wish overnight that Ghana becomes a first world economy. That would require forward thinking and disciplined planning to get there. Number two, make your voice heard. Speak up, but speak, do it respectfully. I was lucky to be asked by my company what functional areas I wanted to work in. Many of you may not be asked, but still, make your voice heard. Making your voice heard does not mean preparing for a fight. Rather, challenge yourself to present your case in such a way that it receives attention. A demanding tone, a sense of entitlement, an accusation, or we know it better than you attitude, none of these will help your case. Life teaches us that doing the needed homework 
presenting it in a constructive and appealing way at the right time has a greater chance of success than otherwise. In short, effective communication is the key for your growth journey. Number three, unfortunately, nobody owes you a thing. You must earn a seat at the table. You must give us a seat on the committee or the board. Because we are the future leaders, we are entitled to some seats now. Really? Your statements may be true, but that approach at getting a seat at the table does not work. It must be earned. What have you done to prove that you can make meaningful contributions to the discussions at the table? Mind you, the conversation at the table is not a pool party. Number four, and this is my special one. Leadership is not just being about being in charge. Around quite often, leadership is not about display of power. It is about getting stuff done. It is about inspiring others and working together with gifted people to achieve a common goal. It is about solving the fundamental problems that we face every day. It is about confronting the hopeless situations we see around and turning them into hopeful situations that give back to us the dignity that we deserve in life. Now, it is true that our neighbor has greener pastures than we do now. But we can grow our own pasture to become as green. It is very worrying to know the number of youth who are on the touchline waiting for the next opportunity to exit the continent. <laughs> the alarming dimension to it is that when their collaborators tell them that we may not be able to get you to your final destination, the response of the majority is that it doesn't matter. Any destination is fine, provided it is outside of here. <laughs> From artisans to doctors, disillusioned, disillusioned, frustrated and angry, looking for bigger and better opportunities. But hold on a minute. The time to grow and nurture our own pasture is now. Do we know how to do it? Of course. Do we have an enabling environment? God has been gracious to us. Let us decide on what pasture we want to grow. Get the seeds and plant them. Some have even started already. And so in no time, we'll begin to enjoy our own green pastures. The time to do it is now, not tomorrow, not next year. Number five, collaboration and teamwork. In our zest for success in life, we should always remember the power of relationships, building connections, collaborating, and working as solid teams. You can go fast alone, but you need others to go far. Six one, embracing diversity and uh, inclusion will make our communities stronger and more resilient. Building resilient communities is, is critical to our development. My work with Core Africa gives me the rare opportunity to engage with and experience the strength, wisdom, and beauty of our community people. Showing respect to them for who they are, listening to their wealth of knowledge and wisdom to understand their motivations, and encouraging them to contribute to their total well-being is achieving great success and result in sustainable development. At the core of this transformation is the need to maintain your identity, but hold on to your values and stay authentic. Last, I'll go to the last one now. In life, many things get tough, and you may not have the luxury of time for seeming trivialities. Other times, the size of your dream may be so big that you trample on other people's uh, hard-won success because you are in the way of your humongous dreams. Never forget that the essence of all our endeavors is to impact humanity. When we lose sight of this, we lose touch with our very uh, excess. I would therefore recommend that you learn about servant leadership. In conclusion... I would challenge you to hold yourself accountable for the decisions you take. Come to terms with the consequences of your actions. Do not blame anyone for any shortcomings in your life. 
In your, on the contrary, be grateful to God for his goodness. Be grateful for the relationships you have built. Look for like-minded, gifted people and begin to turn situations around. Like my company asked me, how do you want to contribute to building your motherland? I encourage you to go out there and be intentional about what you do. Your time indeed is now. Thank you. And God bless our motherland. Youth of Africa, Moses Kofi says your time is. Thank you, Moses. Our next speaker is the founder and convener of the Alliance for Women in Media Africa, an original Yali fellow. Make welcome, Shamima Muslim. Whoa, make some noise. Such talent, such diversity, such resilience of the African youth. Give yourselves a round of applause. When I received the call to make a statement here today, I was initially stunned and then excited and really anxious. And I asked myself, why me? But then I asked, why not me? I am a veil-wearing Muslim woman from the smallest regions in Ghana, the upper west region, in the country, the Wala. In many ways, I am a minority of minority of a minority. In many spaces I've been in, I am often exception, hardly the norm. But that has never held me back. I became one of the first from my immediate family to attain a university education and one of the first, perhaps the only woman from my community to have had a prime time voice on radio and television. My exposure and impact helped inspire many young women, particularly Muslim girls and Northern girls across the country, to believe and to pursue a career in media and journalism. As a founding member of the Alliance for Women in Media, which was inspired by similar organizations in the US, our young dynamic group of media women are working to advance the welfare and visibility of women in media and ensure that the voices, the stories, the images of African women and girls are fairly represented. These examples are not cited to self-praise, but to demonstrate how far I have come. I may have walked a few steps up this platform today, but my journey, like the journey of so many women and girls, goes many steps back across multiple generations within many spaces. Let me mention my maternal grandmother, Alima, an enterprising generous woman who did not have any formal education, but encouraged her daughter in a, an, an appetite for learning and put her in school. Let me talk about my mother, Hajia Rahmat, who after numerous domestic chores at home, had to go to school to sell food before she could go to school. She was often late, but she kept going. My mother said she often walked barefoot to school under the hot sun, which will make the ground heat up and burn the soles of her feet but she kept going and became the first woman within her immediate family to attain higher education by progressing all the way to training college to becoming a teacher and a headmistress. I dare say she could have achieved more, but she sacrificed her dreams at some point to stay home and care for her children. It is because my mother walked that today I am able to run and it is because I ran today that my dear two daughters will fly tomorrow. But this is not a story about mothers and daughters and the power of education for transformation. It is a story about Ghana, about Africa as a continent that ranks low in many development indices. As we make our way up the, transform the transformational ladder, for better representation of women, for better health care, 
education, infrastructure, youth employment, amongst others. The journey can be daunting with many reasons to despair. Some young Africans may feel, I beg your pardon, may feel that their economic salvation lies elsewhere across the Sahara, beyond the Mediterranean. But no matter how hot the grounds beneath our feet, the solution is not across but within. We just have to keep going. We have to put, uh, keep putting in the work. Generation after generation, we will shatter the glass ceilings on Africa's economic prosperity. To attain the Africa we want, we must embrace our diversity. One of the important lessons I learned is the value of community and inclusion, which my dear father, Mr. Ismail Muslim, taught. He was one of the earliest to leave our hometown and set up home here in the capital. He found success early. Our home, he opened his doors to community. I grew up with so many people in our households. Our house was a gateway for a whole generation. I learned the value of service, of diversity, of inclusion very early. He showed me that indeed we rise by lifting others and that, the, and that is the value my husband Al Hassan continued to teach our sons and daughters. Africa is the most diverse continent of the world, more than anywhere else. We must uphold this value of inclusion and diversity. We are so fragmented in nations, ethnicities, gender, class, and others. And unless we work together for the common good, we cannot lift ourselves and our continent up. In lifting ourselves up, we cannot count the success of the very few who reach the top, but by the many who are able to leave the bottom. To make progress, we acknowledge that we have to forge meaningful partnerships. In 2010, I had the rare privilege of being amongst the very first cohort of President Obama's YALI program at the White House. I was lucky to have been spotted by him to ask a question. I asked whether it was possible to have a true partnership between a superpower like America and a developing country like Ghana. Obama believed that such a partnership was possible because we have many aligning interests. Over the years, as I round up, yes. <laughs> in conclusion, I have come to believe, <laughs> I have, um, I've refined the question to ask, would America or the developed world still be interested in Africa without its natural resources? Much as this is an important question for our partners to reflect on, it is an even more important question for us in Africa to answer. How else can we maximize the benefits of our natural resources? And what new value can we harness the energies, creativity of our young people to create, to benefit our people and the world? We must begin to reflect on an African beyond natural resources. Today, it is gratifying to know that many young Africans are already putting, putting in the work. We call on all governments to commit to passing their affirmative action policies to help bridge the gender and diversity gap. And true to the government agency, they need to open up major opportunities for Africa's ballooning population. I feel honored today to share this stage, this space with a phenomenal woman who has not only stepped up to own her space, like Michelle Obama advised us in 2011 in South Africa. She is the highest ranking female official of the United States who has had her fair share of first and broken many glass ceilings on her way to the top. It is a delight to welcome Vice President Kamala Harris to Ghana, the center of the world, black star rising, youth rising, women rising, because we can. Martin Luther King was here, 
Malcolm X was here. Maya Angelou was here. Clinton, Bush, Obama were all here. Now it is her turn. It is my turn. I believe we can all affectionately say, Abina Kamala, you made it. Welcome, Ayiko Gahabanye Yeja Berka. Thank you so very much for being the youth that you continue to be. We will lift this continent up and set it on progressive ways. Amen. Shamima Muslim, ladies and gentlemen. I'm making it here today in the company of ambassadors of Ghana to the United States and of the United States to Ghana and ministers of state of Ghana and the United States, would you please make welcome the Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, His Excellency, Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia. And now, ladies and gentlemen, brace up for the gift of the occasion. We show. We show.
body ndone vita maji maji sito kutenda kutenga sito kujaji naomba sana naomba to be with you here in Ghana and to the people of this incredible continent, to the people of Ghana, and to all the young leaders with us today, students, entrepreneurs, activists, advocates, it is my extraordinary honor to be with you. 
The median age on the African continent is 19. By 2050, one in four people in the entire world will be on this very continent. One in four. That, of course, means what happens on this continent impacts the entire world. Seeing all of you here today makes me so optimistic and excited about this future. The energy, the dynamism, and the potential that each of you embody. And that is why I am here today. As President Joe Biden said at the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit last December, we're all in on Africa. We are all in. Because African nations play such a critical role on issues of global importance, issues that matter to the American people and to the world, issues like food security, the climate crisis, public health, and resilient supply chains. We are all in because African leadership is critical to global and security. African nations are essential partners at the United Nations and in support of international rules and norms. We are all in because the faith of the American people and of America and the continent of Africa are interconnected and interdependent. We are all in because there are long-standing ties between our people. We have an intertwined history, some of which is painful and some of which is prideful, and all of which we must acknowledge, teach, and never forget. Because of this history, this continent, of course, has a special significance for me personally as the first black vice president of the United States of America. <laughs> and this is a history, like many of us, that I learned as a young child. Stories, cultures, and traditions passed down from generations. In addition, this continent has a personal meaning for me because my grandfather and other members of my family worked in Zambia in the 1960s alongside a newly independent people. I was fortunate enough to visit them in Zambia as a young girl. The values that guided my relatives when they were there and the legacy of their efforts remain a source of pride for my entire family and continue to animate my family. So then, what does it mean that the United States of America is all in? It means that the United States is committed to strengthen our partnerships across the continent of Africa. Partnerships with governments, the private sector, civil society, and all of you. Partnerships based on openness, inclusiveness, candor, shared interests, and mutual benefits. And to be clear, America will be guided not by what we can do for our African partners, but what we can do with our African partners. Together, we will address the challenges we face and the incredible 
opportunities ahead. And today, I will speak about one particular area of opportunity, investment in innovation. Innovation, I believe to be the pursuit of what can be unburdened by what has been. Innovation results in one's ability not only to see, but to do things differently. New methods, new products, new approaches, new ideas. We innovate to be more effective and to solve problems. From the invention of new technology to the origin of social movements, innovation has come about by challenging the premise, questioning the status quo, and old thinking. And so to the young leaders here today, you, by your very nature, are dreamers and innovators. And so to you I say, it is your spark, your creativity, and your determination that will drive the future. And with that then, African ideas and innovations will shape the future of the world. And so we must invest in the African ingenuity and creativity, which will unlock incredible economic growth and opportunities, not only for the people of the countries that make up this diverse continent, but for the American people and people around the world. So the Biden-Harris administration and the American people stand ready to partner with you to help accelerate the innovation and entrepreneurship that is already underway. Let's look, for example, at what is happening across the continent in technology, science, agriculture, and clean energy, where innovation is solving local problems and global problems. Just think, before Venmo or Apple Pay, there was M-Pesa in Kenya, a mobile phone payment service that revolutionized the digital financial system. Right now, African nations are pioneering the delivery of healthcare supplies by drone. In Rwanda, this has reduced the delivery time for emergency blood supplies. In Ghana, this service has delivered more than 9 million vaccines, including those for COVID-19. This service has expanded to Kenya and Nigeria and Cote d'Ivoire, and recently to the United States in North Carolina, Arkansas, and Utah. In South Africa, Part of the world's largest radio telescope is under construction, which will help answer some of the biggest questions of humanity about galaxies, about gravity. In Tanzania, plans are underway to build the first facility of its kind on the continent to process minerals that go into electric vehicle batteries. We see water-based farming in Kenya, battery energy storage systems in Malawi, and fintech startups in Nigeria. African ideas and innovations shaping the world, all of which fuel our optimism and hope. Yet, we must also be candid about the challenges from security concerns in the Sahel, to droughts and floods exasperated by the climate crisis, and barriers to economic growth, both on a macro and micro level. We must tackle these challenges and find ways to accelerate opportunity 
growth and stability. And I believe we must be intentional to make progress in three key areas. The empowerment of women, digital inclusion and good governance and democracy, all of which are a focus of my visit to the continent and going forward, and all of which have the potential to create even more innovation. Innovation that will unlock new jobs, new industries, and exponential growth. So let us agree, women around the world must be able to fully participate in economic, political, and social life. And they must be able to participate equally, including in leadership roles. It is a key to maximizing global growth and opportunity. However, we see gender disparities around the world, including in the United States. Disparities we must all address. On the continent of Africa, we know women grow a majority of the food, yet they are less likely to own the land they farm. They represent a majority of frontline healthcare workers, but face disparities in health outcomes. Women are entrepreneurs, yet have limited access to capital and markets. They are peacemakers and bridge builders, yet continue to be underrepresented at the tables where decisions are being made. And there are many factors that impact a woman's ability to survive and thrive. One of those is economic empowerment. And when we lift up the economic status of a woman, let's be clear, we lift up the economic status of her children, her family, her community, the entire economy benefits. So know that the United States of America will work alongside our partners each and every day to close gender gaps here and around the world. And ultimately, our belief is that the empowerment of women is rooted in the concept of freedom, not just freedom from violence or want, but freedom to create one's own future a freedom we desire for all people. The second area where we must together make progress is in the digital economy. Whether you are a student relying on virtual courses, a farmer relying on an app for an early warning about extreme weather, or a small business owner looking to sell goods online, Digital services are essential to 21st century economies. There are places on the continent of Africa that lead the world in digital solutions, yet other places on the continent that lag behind. Expanding access to the internet drives growth and creates opportunity for innovation. Once people are online, they have greater access then to education, greater access to information, and greater access to financial services, which is why the United States will double down on our effort to mobilize billions of dollars in public and private capital from the United States, the continent of Africa, and around the world in order to expand internet access for the benefit of all people here on the continent. To this end, the partnership between the public and private sectors is essential. Partnerships that combine the experience and expertise of the private sector 
with the reach and capacity that only governments can provide. Together, we can unleash growth and opportunity that far exceeds what either the public or private sector can achieve on its own. And the United States is committed to build these types of partnerships to increase digital inclusion on the continent. And finally, to create inclusive economic growth and to advance innovation, we must continue to support and invest in good governance and democracy. Good governance, well, it delivers predictability, stability, and rule of law, which is what businesses need to invest, and what benefits all of society. And good governance is a key attribute of a good democracy. Recent polling tells us the vast majority of Africans support democracy over other forms of government, which reflects our shared desire for freedom and opportunity, transparency and accountability, for free and fair elections, the orderly transition of power, and the protection of fundamental human rights. Indeed, this is a priority for the American people, and it is a global priority. The United States will continue to work alongside democratic governments and in support of democratic aspirations of the people of this continent. In demonstration of this partnership this week, our administration is co-hosting the Zambia, in Zambia, the Summit for Democracy, an opportunity to learn from each other and strengthen democratic institutions. And I will say, while democracy is always a work in progress, including in my own country, the American people will always stand with those yearning for more freedom. And let us be clear that innovation thrives in a democracy. New ideas thrive where freedoms thrive. Free thinking leads to problem solving. And so I believe acting together with intention, we can make progress in these three areas. The empowerment of women, digital inclusion, and good governance and democracy. And just let us take a moment to imagine the future, a future where women are not just included but also lead. Imagine a future where every person is connected to the digital economy, a future where every young person trusts that their voices are heard, a future that is propelled by African innovation. So as we leave here today, let us consider then our shared future. Know the United States will remain a steadfast partner for progress. I am more optimistic than I have ever been about the future and the future of the continent of Africa, and by extension, the world. Not only because of the work we undertake in government, not only because of the investments in the private sector, I am optimistic about the future of the world because of you the woman who will shatter every glass ceiling, the entrepreneur who will identify the next digital breakthrough, the activist who will fight for the dignity of every human being, students and scientists, athletes and artists, 
farmers and fishers and the young innovators who will solve problems that we haven't yet identified with solutions we can't even yet imagine. So all of this to say, you, and in particular the young leaders here, you have a role to play. And together we have a role to play. So then, let us dream with ambition and lead with conviction. Thank you very much. Please remain standing wherever you are. We shall all be led out in sections. Let's make way for the Vice President of our Republic and the official party to take leave of us first. We shall all be led out in sections. Thank you. Told your friend you're not okay And tell me what's wrong and why you never said you felt that way And guess you're trying to stay strong and fake a smile until So anytime you pray